Skinwalkers, by Friends of Alice. I was driving through the interstate, late at night, on one of those roads where it's just empty as far as the eye can see. It's cold, and there's no light other than the dim beams of my 08 Corolla. I lost data a few miles ago and I just wanted to be home. I was pressing down on the gas. 60, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. In the darkness, I suddenly made out a hobbling figure, walking across the road. I slammed on the brakes. The brief instant before I ran over that man felt like an eternity. I memorized every feature of his face before I killed him. He was old, with sagging skin and sunken cheeks. He was bald, save for loose pieces of white hair. But what scared me were his eyes. I looked in his piercing blue eyes and I knew that his death lasted as long as my murder. Was it my fault? No, he was the one crossing a highway, in the middle of the night. He was the one who wasn't looking for traffic. He was the one who didn't see my beams. These things do not make death easier. I got out of the car against my better judgment and walked through thick blackness to find the body. For a moment, I almost believed I imagined the whole thing. But then, there he was. He looked like roadkill. I will spare you the details, except those that are necessary. I swear to you on all that is holy that that corpse had no eyes. While his skull was damaged, it wasn't so ruined that his eyes should have been gone. But there were just two pits of empty flesh staring back at me. The next hour I drove at the edge of my seat. I felt eyes in the woods. Maybe they were wild animals. Maybe. I was beginning to gain some confidence when the street lamps came back. Just then, in the distance, a silhouette hobbled across the street. I braked properly this time. When they saw me, they shuffled to my window. Reluctantly, I rolled it down. Hi, the young man said. He was tall, and crouched down to speak to me. Are you headed down this path long? No, I lied. I'll be taking the next exit. That's where I'm headed, he replied enthusiastically. Do you mind if I ride with you for a bit? I let him in. After an initial period of discomfort, I began to appreciate his presence. His name was James. He was a farmer, and he owned several acres of land in the area. He seemed a bit old-fashioned with his outfit and mannerisms, but he was a decent man. Finally, I asked the question building on my mind. So James, I said, what's got you out so late at night? His expression darkened. I'm looking for my father. In the dim light of the street I could not help but notice how blue his eyes were. I turned my face to look only at the road. Why? What happened? There's blood on your shirt. It took me a moment to realize my nose was bleeding. As I covered it, he began to speak. My father, he began, as a very old man. He's lived a long life. He's not strong enough to work anymore, but he gets restless sitting at home. So he goes on walks. Hours at a time, he usually doesn't come back until midnight. Isn't that dangerous? Nothing from the forests would harm us. I could feel James's eyes staring into the side of my head. No, I usually trust him to find his way home. But I heard him yell out, so something may have happened. Did the old man scream as he died? He didn't. I was sure he didn't. But even if he did, it was miles away. Surely this was a different person. It was impossible. It, I asked you a question, said James. Did you see anything? As the street lamps whizzed past us, James was continuously revealed in light before being hidden in shadow. When the lights shone upon him, he was a friendly looking man, even if his smile stretched a bit too far. In the darkness, he was completely invisible, apart from his shining blue eyes. No, you're the first person I've seen in a long time. James tilted his head. Are you sure? I gripped tight to the steering wheel. It's been completely empty. It's haven't. James grabbed my shoulder. Look at me, he ordered. And I did. As we passed streetlights, he was covered and uncovered in light. Each time the dim lights revealed him, he took the shape of a different animal. First a fox, then a wolf, then a bear, then a different man, and finally himself. 
Through it all, his eyes remained that same color. That same shining blue. It occurred to me that I was being preyed upon. Are you sure? He asked. So I confessed. I told him exactly what happened, as it seemed from my perspective. In turn, he listened, and it felt like everything around me fell silent to listen, too. My heart rate slowed. When there's nothing else you can do, there's no point in stressing. He let go of my shoulder. I had forgotten he was holding onto it. After a long pause, he spoke. As you leave, do not stop for anything. And when you leave, do not ever come back. Those were the last words he spoke to me. I drove alone after that, but for miles I was watched. There were many other strangers on the road that night. I doubt any of them would have done what James did, let me go with a slap on the wrist. But he saw me first, and I made it home safe that night. If there's a takeaway from this, it's that I am very, very lucky. The next time I get the lottery wrong, or my packages are lost, I will think of this and remember I have spent enough luck to last several lifetimes. Sometimes I will see a bird watching me for a bit too long, and I will know they haven't forgotten me. So I hang a feeder. It's best to be grateful. I saw a skinwalker, by prestigious Park 4880. It was a few years back during a road trip with my buddy, Jake. We were cruising through the desert, chasing that feeling of freedom you only get on the open road. But little did we know, we were about to encounter something that would shatter that sense of freedom and leave us fighting for our lives. We were driving through Navajo territory, miles away from civilization, when we saw it, a figure standing by the side of the road, illuminated by the headlights of our car. At first, we thought it was just a trick of the light, but as we got closer, we realized it was something else entirely. It looked like a man, but there was something off about him. His eyes glowed in the darkness, and his limbs seemed too long, too twisted. And then, just as quickly as we saw him, he vanished into the desert night. We tried to shake it off, telling ourselves it was just our imaginations running wild. But as we continued down the road, things took a turn for the worse. We started hearing strange noises outside the car scratching at the windows, whispers on the wind. Jake laughed it off, but I could tell he was nervous. I was too, and then, without warning, something slammed into the side of the car, sending us careening off the road and into the desert. The car flipped over, and everything went dark. When I came to, Jake was nowhere to be found. I stumbled out of the wreckage, calling out for him, but all I heard was the sound of my own voice echoing through the desert. I searched for hours, but there was no sign of him. That's when I saw it, the figure from before, standing on a nearby ridge, watching me with those glowing eyes. I knew then what we were dealing with a skinwalker, a creature of Navajo legend, able to take on the form of any animal or human it chooses. I didn't waste any time. I ran as fast as I could, the sound of my heart pounding in my ears. But no matter how far I ran, I couldn't shake the feeling that it was still out there, hunting me, waiting for the right moment to strike. It took me days to make it back to civilization, days filled with fear and paranoia. And when I finally reached help, I told them everything, about the skinwalker, about Jake, about the nightmare that had become my reality. But no one believed me. They said it was just a trick of the desert, a figment of my imagination. But I know the truth. I know what I saw that night, and I'll never forget it. The desert may be vast and empty, but it's also home to things that lurk in the shadows, things that are better left undisturbed. And if you ever find yourself driving through the desert at night, remember one thing beware the skinwalker, for it is always watching, always waiting, and it will stop at nothing to claim its prey. Old Whispers of the Desert By Hooker with a Penis The arid desert landscape is something one never fully gets used to. The canyons and sand stretch out for what feels like an eternity. However, beneath the watchful eyes of the four sacred mountains of the Navajo, 
casting a silent vigil over the land, there is a feeling of serenity. Amongst the whispers of the wind and the shifting sands, tales of the old ways and ancient spirits lingered, or at least that's what the elders would have you think. In my opinion that's all stories used to entertain or frighten children. In my small community nestled on the edge of the reservation, I always found myself drawn into the vast wilderness that laid between the canyons and valleys of the mountains. I tend to be a person who keeps to themselves, seeking solace in the desert as a means to escape the dull monotony of everyday life. I like to camp and live for the nights under the stars far away from any city to drown out their beautiful light. On one evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the land, I encountered a stranger in the desert after I had finished setting up my fire. The man was a wanderer, dressed in what seemed to be clothes from last century. I looked to find his eyes obscured by the darkness of an old gambler hat, making his presence unsettling. You shouldn't be out here alone if you're not from the res. I cautioned, feeling my voice tinged with unease. The stranger sat across from me and chuckled, a sound devoid of warmth. Alone. We are never truly alone in these lands, Jonah. There are things that walk among us, things that defy explanation. My heart skipped a beat at the mention of my name as he gazed into the depths of the fire as it crackled, sensing a darkness that seemed to stretch beyond the confines of his person and start to overtake my own senses. What do you mean, and how do you know my name? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. The stranger leaned in closer, his raspy voice making the hairs on my neck stand up. I know everyone and everything in these lands. There are legends whispered among the tribes, tales of creatures that stalk the night, wearing the skins of men and beast. My blood ran cold as I continued listening to the stranger's words, my mind racing with images of ancient spirits and malevolent entities that lurked in the shadows. Things I believed were made up to scare children. Skinwalkers, the stranger whispered, the word hanging heavy in the air like a curse. As quick as the stranger appeared he was gone. From that moment on, I found myself consumed by the darkness that plagued the land. I would spend days out in the desert, searching for hints of twisted creatures and echoing whispers that seemed to emanate from the very earth itself. I should have told the elders, but my curiosity to learn more about these things outweighed my fear. As the days turned to weeks, my obsession grew, driving me deeper into the heart of the desert. I sought answers to questions that I dared not speak aloud, my mind unraveling with each passing day. But the more I searched, the more elusive the truth became. It was as if the land itself conspired to keep its secrets hidden shrouding the truth in layers of darkness that only the most foul creatures can see through. Then, one moonlit night, as I stood on the edge of the reservation, gazing out into the vast expanse of darkness, I felt a presence looming behind me. I turned, my heart pounding, to confront the stranger once more. But what stood before me was not a man, but a creature of nightmares, its form twisted and contorted, its eyes burning with an unholy fire. It looked as if evil itself was staring into my soul. You have trespassed into my domain, Jonah, the creature hissed, its voice a guttural growl that sent shivers down my spine. I only wanted to learn the truth, I said, trying to keep my voice from sounding like a scared child at that point. But I realized something, and got a sinking feeling in my heart. My revelation was that I had played right into the hands of the skinwalker lured by the promise of knowledge and power. Then, as if reading my mind the creature smiled. It had an awful grin that sent shivers all over my body, but it seemed to be changing. Before my eyes now stood a coyote, it stared at me with that same sinister look as before, only to turn and disappear into the darkness. I don't know how I made it home alive. All I know is that I'm never going out in the desert again. I've been blessed by a medicine man since then who believes the skinwalker saw something in me. What that is I'll never know and I hope I never do. Something Cut Me Open in the Woods by Arcane Hackist I want to start out by saying I'm not a cop, I'm not a park ranger, I'm not some Bigfoot hunter that would just run off into the woods for nothing. 
I don't live in a farmhouse with a shotgun under my bed for the coyote sounds some people just decide are skinwalkers. I've been hiking for as long as I could walk. My dad taught me what specific birds looked like, and then what they sounded like. Even now, there's a shelf five feet high in my living room stocked with nature books. I knew the differences between local species of woodpeckers before I was eight. I've been a wildlife researcher in Wyoming for maybe seven years now. I'm a young guy, kind of baby-faced, so I get odd looks a lot when I'm out with all the equipment. It's rural here, mostly livestock, quiet, apart from when everyone drives up to Cheyenne for the rodeo every year. I can't go anymore, saw a horse break its leg during the wild horse race and I never really got over it. Sorry, I am kind of distracted. I had to fill up jerry cans for my truck the other day, and my mind is so all over the place even the station's cashier noticed. It feels really far away, what happened to me? Five days ago, I went into a private swath of forest on the edge of a lake, all owned by some group of enterprising millionaires wanting to build some of those stupid cabins you see on TV with the marble counters despite the rustic goal. Distracted again, anyway. I was out there because they found six dead elk within one week. One week. This property is big, but it's not that big. There are wolves in Yellowstone, not here, and they obviously wanted to know if there was some big fuck-off bear starting to kill for sport. Some of the rich hunters that rented weeks during the season would be angry, too, if bulls they'd been following on trail cams got eaten before they could be stuck up above the fireplace. The first carcass they marked was three quarters of a mile in. I'm an all right navigator, sometimes have trouble getting places but I'm good at following markers on my way out. I'm pretty visual, it was late morning, maybe 10. I wasn't going to be an idiot, and let it get dark. The first body told me it wasn't a bear, I didn't know what my opinion really was yet, or if I ever had one. I don't know if you've ever seen an elk or someone posing with a dead one, but they're big. This one had an almost cartoonish impact imprint in the pine needles, like those craters asteroids leave in movies. Like it had been tossed diagonally toward the ground really hard. It was a cow, on her side, split from where her jawbone ended at her neck all the way down. Between both front legs, down her gut, stopping after her back legs. I noticed almost immediately when, what do you do? You know, examine, poke it with a stick, I put my gloves on and took a closer look that whatever it was had almost cleaved her in half, maybe six inches to spare. The cut was sharp, I've never seen anything like it. Right through her sternum the smoothest I'd seen anything like that. With the shoulder high gloves on I examined her internally, propping the upper of her front legs up. Her heart and her liver were missing. It scared me, I think I was trying to rationalize it. I got there and saw her, no blood on the ground, with two missing organs, and guts all neatly in place like they'd been put back when. Yeah, I just told myself it was poachers. When I got to the second carcass, a bull elk, it started to change my mind. I don't know if you've ever been around something decaying or had a mouse die in your house. It doesn't take a lot of flesh to make something stink you can empty your pool filter too close to the house and still smell the bugs. Neither of them stunk, at all. At the bull I noticed what I hadn't at the cow. There were no flies. His liver was missing like hers, and though I had trouble leveraging his leg up and got kind of frustrated I found his heart was missing too. The injuries were the same. Dead, stone cold dead. I've been around a lot of animals that have died in some way or another. Nothing had ever chilled me to my goddamn bones like this did. I was on the way to the third one when I was attacked. I never got to see the third one or the remaining three, because I ended up having to drive to the clinic after. I'm going to try to give this as much detail as I fucking can remember, because I swear I'm not crazy. There were these two rocks with a hiking trail between, the path worn by both animals and people. The rocks went up maybe 10 feet on either side, each about the width of how my truck is long with a couple feet between them and the path. 
I remember thinking I needed to try spikes for my boots because the pine needles this time of year got pretty slippery in places where they were thick. I didn't hear anything really notable. I crushed a pinecone under my boot, and then it was on me. It looked like something I'd imagine would crawl out of a cave, in the body. Slim, bipedal, but with digitigrade hind legs. It came out of nowhere, and it was so quiet. You're going to ask me how I even noticed all of that, and it's because it jumped down from the rocks to land in front of me. I was almost out, and there was a lot of ground behind me to cover. One step back, and it pushed its back foot at me. Not all that fast, not a blow, just the way someone would reach for a handshake. It had hooves, and I smelled burnt hair. I remember now those videos from that martial arts style where you can do one-inch punches, and, yeah. It felt like a car hit me in the chest. Like I'd taken a hit from a bighorn ram. It crushed the breath out of me and I flew backward. The forest floor broke my fall, and by the time I gasped in air and focused it was staring me directly in the eyes. Its skin wasn't white, not really, translucent. I could see its veins and arteries, pulsing beneath, in the rhythm of a heartbeat pushing so. Quickly. It was maybe shock, maybe fear that kept me still with it down on all fours like that. I don't think it was breathing. We were so close that I could see the blood vessels in its eyes. It was larger than me, larger than an elk. Moose-sized, as big as a fucking full-size van. Its head was a foot wide, maybe more, gaunt and shaped like a bison skull. The skin was stretched over it so tight it looked like it had ripped its nostrils long slits that went maybe halfway up its head. The eyes that looked into mine were large, with no fleshy eyelid, and when it finally blinked two clear lids came in from the outer edges of its eyes. Its sclerus, besides the blood vessels red, like us were so white. Everything's got a little color in its eyes, but this was the whitest white I'd ever seen. There wasn't an iris, and its pupil was just, clear. Like when they take a photo of the back of your eye at the eye doctor. It felt like I was seeing the inside of its skull and it. Fuck, sorry, I'm trying to be rational and not get all shivery and supernatural with it. It just stared. I'd worked with dogs when I started my career with animals. It was instinct, maybe, wanting it to be done quicker trying to calm it like I'd talk to dogs with my body language. I tilted my head up and to the side went limp, closed my eyes. It felt like two hours before it moved. It probably was five minutes. I opened my eyes when I heard it rustle, but didn't move. It brought up its front foot arm I guess, stood up a little higher, and that's when I understood. It looked like it had fucking scythes on its hands. A palm shaped like ours, one finger joint, then these claws a foot long. Three of them and a thumb that had no claw at all. I thought I almost knew it'd cut me in fucking half and I'd be gone, but it moved so slow. It brought that hand up, took one of its four fingers and dragged that claw down from my collarbone. I was wearing a canvas coat, with a sweatshirt, and thermals underneath. It started to split me. I moved my head, like watching a car crash, as it sliced through all of my clothing and down into my skin like air. Not like butter, like air. It cut maybe a half inch into me. Adrenaline is a fucking drug, I'll tell you that. It stopped two inches below my belly button, and then it turned and started to walk away like nothing had happened at all. Just moseying, as I sat up a little and started to really feel it. It had turned away from me, stood up tall. The horns it had reminded me of five pronghorns spliced, not quite antlers, and now I saw it had floppy bald ears like a pig. I could see where every vertebrae in its body pushed up against the skin, the definition of every muscle like a shaved horse on every steroid. With its skin that clear, it almost blended and reflected the colors around it. I laid there and watched it go until I couldn't see it anymore, toward the lake. I think I heard a boat motor. I didn't even care. When managed to get on my feet I fucking ran. There was paracord in my truck and I put my jacket on backwards and tied it around me to put on some pressure while I drove to the tiny medical clinic. 
My brain gets a little spotty right before that. Quiet town. Nobody kicked by a horse today, so I got in and the doctor, Jen, I've known her since I moved here. Older lady got to me immediately. I remember that she took the jacket off and went kind of pale, looking at. There wasn't any blood, I could see my flesh split perfectly down the middle. In the mirror on the wall above the sink in the exam room I saw how well it was centered between the bumps of my collarbones. She told me they'd bandage it, and I just basically sat there in some kind of shock and let them move me around. I don't even remember the drive there, or home. It reminded me of autopsy cuts in TV shows with two less lines, and higher. Jen's an old soul, her family's been in this state longer than any I can think of. She's 30 but graying at the temples. Down to earth, she's sweet, and very logical, and as tired as hell of telling people Bigfoot doesn't live out here when they find out she's a local and ask. It terrified me when in that empty waiting room, escorting me out, she told me in a low voice that I'd better go out see the Joneses, because their livestock guardian dog had died. She had this look on her face when she said it, patting my back, and just said, um hum. A bear, it reminded me of that tone someone uses when someone else says something they don't believe. Patronizing, oh, it was a bear, sure. Just like that, I wanted to throw up, I don't know if she knew. I just left, I feel like I'm being pulled into something terrifying. I've been looking at apartments in Portland all night. I've been trying to draw the thing like I used to with animals back home but I just can't get it right. I feel like Jen is trying to get me to look into this. I barely know her, but she looked at me like she knew everything about me. Help, I guess, what do I do?